Nobody really knew my name. No one knew who I was. I drink iced coffee all year round. It does not matter if it's negative five degrees outside. Educators this year, on average, they're spending over $800 in out-of-pocket costs on school supplies. Stolen from my house and brought to school. The primary reason why teachers are heavily dissatisfied is because they do not feel supported by their school administration. When you have a bad principal, it ruins the entire experience of all of the teachers in the school. Get out of your office, get into the classrooms, check in with your teachers, check in with the students, be present and be there for them. So having everybody on the same page and on the same team giving me input for the IEP helps us create a program that's going to reach and teach the whole child rather than just a deficit area. Yeah, like like really fast, like or maybe teleportation would be a little more accurate. Welcome to our show. Today we have an incredible guest who has been a special education teacher for the past seven years. Aside from being a rock star educator, our guest has a loyal following on social media with over 110,000 followers and over 10 million views. Our guest, Rebecca Poe, creates high quality resources for special education teachers. You can find her work on Teachers Pay Teachers. Join me today with our incredible guest while we discuss the topics of mental health, special education, coffee, and teleportation. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, so I want to get started. I know that your social media followers know you for being a special education teacher. Uh, before we dive into education, I'd love to learn more about you. So I understand you were roughly 30 years old when you first started your teaching job. So I want to know, can you walk us through what 21-year-old Rebecca was up to? Did you always want to be a, a teacher at a young age? did not want to be a teacher. I was in school for art. I was working toward a bachelor's of fine arts degree and was engaged and getting ready to get married. I got married very young. My husband and I were both very young. Um, so my long-term career goals were not quite on my mind yet. I was very focused okay. on wedding planning, getting ready to graduate with an art degree and then life happened. We got married. Um, my husband had to finish student teaching. I dropped out of school for a little while to support our family while he was doing that. Um, then we had our daughter. So it was several years down the road before I went back to school at the encouragement of a principal that I was working for. Um, when I was a paraprofessional, she was very determined that I go back for an education degree. So it was it was a long road with many different ins and outs, but eventually I got to I got to be where I am and I started teaching. I finished my master's degree in special education at the age of 30. Wow. Okay. So that's incredible. So even though you didn't officially start teaching as a teacher or a special education teacher by 30, you were still immersed in the education field because you just mentioned you were a paraprofessional, correct? Correct. So I, my very first year teaching ever, I taught art at a private school. Um, after that, I spent about seven years working as a paraprofessional in high school setting, elementary, middle school. I worked, I worked everywhere in multiple different arenas, inclusion, self-contained. And that's when I decided, you know, if I'm going to be doing this anyway, I might as well get the, <laughs> have the big title. That is definitely the right reasoning <laughs> and definitely makes sense. So I want to go ahead and talk about our next topic. I, I do I do know your Instagram handle uh, for a long time was Lessons and Lattes, uh, yes. and you changed it to Rebecca Poe Teaching. Mm -hmm. Now, before I get into the why, I'd love to know the story behind the name Lessons and Latte. Why, why did you choose that for your Instagram handle name? Well, um, everyone who knows me knows I am a coffee-obsessed, you know, caffeine junkie. So... <laughs> For for me, um, coffee is not my life, but you know it's it's how I start my day. It's that cup of comfort that I need um, multiple times throughout the day to kind of get me through. And my bachelor's degree did not end up being in art; it was in English. So alliteration is always something that I thought was a lot of fun, and right. I loved the the two L's together. And I thought, what better way to tie my love of teaching with my love of coffee than lessons and lattes. Okay, I feel like we have a strong bond already because I'm a <laughs> coffee addict as well. Yes. And actually, let me go in and grab my coffee 
right now and I'll take a sip of it. I can't do anything, by the way, without drinking coffee. Here, mm -hmm. I get I get made fun of all the time. Uh, I'm a huge Dunk, Dunkin' Donuts fan. Mm -hmm. but let me, before we before we continue on, is it Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts? Well, so I started out as a Starbucks girl, but recently I've been I've been enjoying Dunkin' a little bit more. I think their coffee is <laughs> a little less bitter. I like the flavor right. of it. Starbucks. I hope you're saying that because I have a Dunkin' Donuts uh, coffee in my hand, but this is my absolute favorite. I like Starbucks, but Dunkin' Donuts is mm -hmm. really the way to go. Uh, but I drink iced coffee all year round. It does not okay. matter if it's negative five degrees outside. Uh, so that's <laughs> awesome. I feel like we can connect. I mean, I know there's a lot of people who love coffee, but coffee is like an obsession with me. So it's I, I really now it's trait at this point. Like it's it's <laughs> part of who I am. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Same over here. Mm -hmm. So now I want to dive in. So it's less it's lessons lattes. Now you change mm -hmm. your name. I want to know the reasoning behind why did you decide to change your name? After all, you did build up a very nice and big audience. You have about one hundred fourteen thousand followers. Correct me if I'm wrong. I do apologize. A little, a little less, like one hundred and twelve. Okay, <laughs> one hundred twelve thousand. Okay, uh, so pretty close, but still very big and substantial. Uh, so, but you know, changing your handle is a big decision, especially when you do have a large number of followers. So, uh, what what was the reasoning for that change? So, I I realized that while everyone knew lessons and lattes, nobody really knew my name. No one knew who I was. So, when I would be on a guide or a program for a conference. And it said Rebecca Poe. People were like, "Oh, who is who is that?" And then we had to explain, "Oh, well, that's I'm Lessons and Lattes on Instagram." And oh yeah, I follow you. And like people would recognize my face, and I would I would be seen out places. Oh, you're Lessons and Lattes. I'm like, I'm Rebecca. <laughs> I'm Rebecca Poe. So right. the more the more I'm doing the conferences and appearances and writing more and trying to you know get more into different areas of the education world, I wanted to put my name with it okay. and my name on it so people would know who I am rather than just my brand. That is definitely, I think you made the 100% uh, correct move. Um, and it's, so I, I, I know you, it's, it's a personal brand, so that is definitely the right move for you, but even at companies. So for example, for us, Argo Prep, we are a tech company. And uh, back in the days, or back in the days, it's always been uh, companies put out products and people know the company names, but now what consumers are doing or what consumers believe in is they want to see a face behind the company. They want to believe in the, in the person and not the company. So it's very important, especially this younger generation, they're way more attached to, let's say, Rebecca Poe, as opposed to company X. You know, if you were running a company and if you had 20 teachers, you really have to build out a personal brand nowadays to capture the attention of younger students uh, and, and it's just a big consumer shift that we see. So that is absolutely the right move. And, and, and that's fantastic. Now, I do want to let you know, I did look at almost all of your Instagram photos and videos. It's cool. It's awesome. It's filled with beautiful pictures, by the way, of supplies, pictures, arts and crafts. Mm -hmm. And I do see every other picture is with you with a coffee mug or a coffee or some kind of uh, iced coffee that you drink. That's it's that's awesome. Part of my life. <laughs> But I do want to say something. So uh, the National Education Association released some horrifying data uh, just this year of October of 2022, stating that educators this year, on average, they're spending over $800 in out-of-pocket costs on school supplies. I know that sounds kind of high, but that is what the studies show, especially this year. It's just been dramatically increasing. So I want to kind of dig into this topic a little bit more. Do you have a rough idea about how much money you typically spend out of pocket when it comes to your classroom? So I I would estimate, guesstimate probably between three to five hundred of three to five hundred. Mm -hmm. And what is it that is what is it exactly that you're purchasing that is not being reimbursed by your schools? So for for the school that that I was working in, the district I was working in, we did get classroom money that we could spend, but okay. it was we had to make a list, we had to send it in, we had to get it approved, they had to eventually order it. Well, first we had to wait for the funds to be made available. Then okay. the process would start. Then we'd have to wait. So the things that we requested back in the fall, we weren't getting until mm -hmm. the middle of spring. So if there was something that I needed immediately that wasn't on hand, I would have to go get it. 
I would have to, you know, ask, you know, can like, I know for, for my daughter's teacher, she'll say, hey, we need this for the classroom. We need snacks for the classroom. Can somebody chip in and do that? So I'll, I'll buy a big box of goldfish crackers for her classroom. Um, just different things that are more immediate needs rather than things that I can wait for. Like I would always order a ton of printer ink because right. I have some leftover from the year before. But if there was a specific craft that I wanted to make or a specific project I wanted to do with the kids, I couldn't wait until the spring when I could order it with my classroom money. It would have to be something that I would purchase myself. And right. I think first year, second year teachers, like early in my teaching career, I was spending that three to 500 probably a year because there's a lot of social media influence where you see these amazing products that right. teachers are doing and these pro not products, projects that teachers are doing with their students and you feel the need to keep up. So you feel the need to purchase all of the latest things. And right. that's not the case. The stuff that you see on, on my account is probably stuff that I've either stolen from my house and brought to school or right. it's things that I've had for years that I'm continuing to use. I, I tried really hard to kind of shift away from that, go to Target and buy this brand new resource right now right. because teachers are spending, like you said, an obscene amount of money on their classroom right. out of their own pockets. And we're already not paid very much. So when right. we're spending our own salary back into our classroom, it kind of, you know, takes away from what we are being paid. No, a hundred percent. And I, and you would agree that almost every teacher, you know, spends money out of their pocket, oh, right? For sure. For sure. Yeah, My husband it's... is also a teacher. I'll come home and be like, what did you buy from Amazon? Oh, I needed this for the class. Okay. <laughs> it, 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 it really makes me disappointed that teachers continue to have to spend more uh, money out of their pockets. And as you just mentioned, teachers do not get paid that well. We understand, we know exactly, like there are salary bans and ranges that the DOE approves. Mm -hmm. And it is just, I mean, I don't want to even talk about it because it, we don't want to go into it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole soapbox that I could yeah. get on. But. We can have a two hour conversation about that. Uh, but I do want to let the viewers know that, you know, I, the IRS does have a educator expense deduction mm -hmm. that allows teachers to now deduct up to $300 worth of qualified mm -hmm. expenses for the fiscal year of 2022. It used to be $250 forever. Mm -hmm. They bumped it up to $300. That's fantastic, but honestly, it doesn't do much. On average, teachers are spending more. It's eating into their their salary, you know. So it is it is uh, ex extremely disappointing. I was going to ask you to walk me through the process of w what it is uh, when it comes to reimbursement by your school administrator, but you kind of already answered that. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about the next topic, which is uh, teacher dissatisfaction. Now, it's no surprise that teacher dissatisfaction has gone up in the past few years. Mm -hmm. uh, teachers have greater responsibilities with unrealistic expectations from school leadership. So teachers are dealing with increased student behavioral issues. Additionally, teachers continue to be severely underpaid, as we just mentioned. Now, there was a survey conducted this, uh, this June by the American Federation of Teachers, where 74% of teachers, 74%, of teachers stated that they're dissatisfied and they are considering to leave the profession within the next two years. Now, what may be surprising for the, the viewers that are watching or teachers or parents that are watching to this is that the primary reason why teachers are heavily dissatisfied is because they do not feel supported by their school administration. Now, I want to clarify that, okay, school administration, that seems kind of big. Uh, sorry, it sounds vague. When I say school administration, nine out of 10 times, I am referring to the principles of the school. I don't want to talk bad things. You know, I don't, we're not going to go into the topic about principles, but when you have a bad principle, it ruins the entire experience of all of the teachers in the school. Now, I'm not going to ask you about your personal experience with your school leaders, but I do want to hear some advice that you could give from your side to principals, you know, or perhaps new principals that are entering into the space. How can they support teachers more? Because the dissatisfaction of teachers is nine out of 10 times related to their principal, their school leader. So I am actually going to talk a little bit about the principles that I had because I want to share the positive things that they were doing that I would like to see other principles follow and model. Um, 
I've talked with several friends who have not had the same experience with principals that I've had. This, this, especially the last principal that I worked under, she was phenomenal. She gave her teachers the autonomy to make decisions for their classroom, but still offered support and encouragement and check-ins. She treated us like people. She didn't treat us like employees. She didn't treat us like commerce. We we're people first and we have issues that come up and family emergencies that need to be taken care of. And I was never made to feel guilty for needing to take a day off if my daughter was sick or if I was sick. And just having somebody who really, you felt like they were on your side and they understood that you're a person and you're not just an employee and you're not just a teacher. That's not your whole identity. Supporting the employees, supporting the teachers, going to the rooms, asking, how are you? Not, you know, how's your class doing? How's your lesson? How are you, Rebecca Poe, doing today? So just her, her support, she's the one actually who encouraged me to step out of the classroom and into a different role that I'm in now that's still in education, but it's not within the four walls of a classroom. She really supported me in that and was excited for me. And I know leaving the classroom when I did kind of put everybody in a bind looking for another teacher, but she never made it feel like I needed to be guilty for that. And that was incredible. That makes me very happy to hear that. Honestly, I, I generally like hearing stories like that. And again, there are a lot of principles. Most principles are great. Like, I, I don't want to paint this, you know, like weird picture that <laughs> like nine out of 10 principles are bad. No, no, no. That's not the case. It's the, the dissatisfied teachers more often than not, it's because school leadership, the leadership team is not supporting uh, uh, teachers the right way, whether it's I mean, whether it's a principal or in general, or, you know, we can get into the politics of districts and how they play a big role and how they pressure principals and all this kind of stuff. But we're not going to get into that. Um, but. Uh, so, so in general, so in general, if it's a new principal going into the school, what kind of, what, what advice would you give them? Get out of your office, get into the classrooms, check in with your teachers, check in with the students, be present and be there for them. Because I know being an administrator, being a principal, that job is never ending and it is often very thankless. And it's easy to kind of get holed up in the day-to-day -day aspects in your office where you're taking care of discipline issues or you know emails from superintendents but as much as you can be a presence in the school get make sure the teachers know you make sure the students know you just having that relationship where people feel like you're approachable that's going to make such a difference in how how people respond to you as a leader that is some great advice in, in fact i was just at a national principals conference where did we go i'm sorry kentucky kentucky yeah. we went to kentucky it was uh the national associations of principals some big conference and there was a keynote presentation and it was actually simon sinek and he made a really good point which is the number one responsibility of a principal is simply to stay focused and care about their teachers. The principal's job is not to worry about the student, not to worry about the disciplinary actions that they need to take with students. The number one job, the primary role that you have as a principal is to take care of your team. And that team is just your staff. And that is what you should really be focused on. And when a principal is super focused on building out a great team, empathizing with teachers, walking into classrooms, asking, hey, Rebecca, how do you feel today? Those are what make a great leader. Uh, so thank you for that advice. That is some amazing advice. Uh, so I do want to apologize in advance. I'm asking you all these questions and I didn't ask you a single question when it comes to your actual expertise, which is special education and the best practices when it comes to working with students with IEPs. Now, first of all, uh, the Pew Research Center shows that New York has the largest number of students with disabilities enrolled in public schools. If a parent is seeing that their child is struggling in school and it may be related to a disability that is affecting the child's educational performance, can you walk me through the steps of what a parent needs to do for their child in order for them to become eligible for special education? So the first thing, at least in my area, 
if a parent requests testing for special education, a referral for evaluation meeting needs to be held. Sorry, eligibility is later referral for evaluation. So we would, we would hold that initial referral meeting and review the student's data to determine whether as an IEP team, we believed the student needed to be recommended for special education testing. So the parent can request that meeting, but that's not going to guarantee that testing is going to occur. Sometimes there might not have been enough time between maybe the start of a school year and when the parent is initially requesting testing um, because we have to show that strategies have been put in place for that student and that those strategies have been ineffective. And that can take, you know, six to nine weeks easily before you can see you know, if something is really going to be improving, if something is staying the same, or if there's no improvement, no progress is being made. So once we have that data and we can see, all right, this is what's already been being done for the student in the classroom. This has not been working. The student is continuing to struggle. There could be another underlying cause. So at that point, we would accept the referral and turn it over to our testing team. At some schools, the teachers do the testing. Um, in my district, it was turned over to a team of psychometrists who would come to the school and do the testing for special education. Okay, I wanna talk briefly about uh, creating a successful IEP plan. Can you let me know? So obviously there's a couple of people involved in creating an IEP plan for a specific student. Uh, can you let me know like, who, who's Absolutely. involved? Absolutely, so whenever I would write an IEP, I, of course, I'm involved. I have a general education teacher. Um, I have the parent, the student, and a local education agency representative. So that can be the principal. I've had it be principal designees before, like counselors or assistant principals, different things like that. But when you're writing the IEP, or when I would write the IEP, I requested input from the parent, the student, and the student's general education teachers. I wanted to know what they were seeing in their classrooms, what strategies they've been using, how well they've been working or not working. I wanted to hear from the parent about what is your child interested in? Are there any behaviors that you're seeing at home that we're also seeing at school that will need to be addressed? And for the student, I want to know, you know, what are your goals? What do you think you need to improve on? What do you feel your strengths are? What are your interests? That helps me get a whole picture of the child rather than just uh, we're seeing this academic deficit, there's so much more to the child than that one area. So having everybody on the same page and on the same team giving me input for the IEP helps us create a program that's going to reach and teach the whole child rather than just a deficit area. Okay, okay. And I do have to admit, I did take a look at some of your blogs and I, I, I know that you wrote a blog about some friction between like a general education teacher and special education teachers, right? Can you talk just a, briefly a little bit more about that? Is there, like what, what, what do you see any issues when you're communicating with a general education teacher as you're trying to develop an IEP plan? Because I know that when we talk about special education, there's all these lingos and, you know, acronyms and things like that, where general education teachers may not be familiar with that. So do, is there any issues that arise from that it or not really? Be. I always made it a point to really explain or try to explain what everything meant to the general education teacher and not only what the actual term meant, but also what it meant was going to be expected of them. And the same for the family. For special education teachers, you know, that's that's everything we do all day, every day. We're using the acronyms. We're using the very specialized terms. And for a general education teacher, they might hear us say a sentence that's basically all letters and not really know what all of those letters mean. <laughs> and same for the parents. Right. So I, I wrote an ebook, just a little, a little guide to about a dozen special education terms and acronyms that are very common in IEP meetings and the special education process. And I've, I gave that out to some teachers. I've given it to some family members um, just so that everyone can kind of be on the same page about what these terms are going to mean. And I try to make sure that in a meeting, I explained it in a way that made sense to everyone there, not just someone who is very familiar with the process and very familiar with the terms. 
Got it. So we are going to link that over over here in the video. So we, we most of our teachers are, I mean, we're based in New York City. So we work with a lot of New York City and New York State teachers. And I just mentioned to you that New York State is one of the highest, well, it is the highest number of students enrolled in special education. So if you're a general education teacher watching this, uh, you, <laughs> let's get you familiar with some of these terms over here. You know, so we'll have that link up. Uh, so I want to talk, uh, can you just share some best practices for new teachers that are specialized in special education that will be actually entering just into the classroom? Can you share just any yeah. advice? That so you my biggest for them? piece of advice is don't reinvent the wheel. So a buzzword that we hear in education and that we're going to continue to hear in education is differentiation. And differentiation does not necessarily mean that each student is getting an entirely separate lesson than every other student. You can take the same lesson, tweak just a little bit, and it will work for multiple students. And chances are the accommodations that you're giving to one student are probably going to benefit the majority. It doesn't have to be highly, right. highly individualized for each student in your class. If you have a lot of students with IEPs, have a good relationship with that special education teacher. When you get those IEPs at the beginning of the year, read through them, note any questions that you have, mm -hmm. and ask your special education team member to go over it with you so that you really understand what is expected of you in that IEP and what you're expected to provide for that student. But chances are you're going to be doing the best practices for that student, probably without knowing it, because you know, you, right. you went to school for it. You've, you've been in the classroom, you know, your kids, you know what they need, and you're probably going to figure out what they need without needing a whole lot of extra help, but that help is going right. to be there. Just don't be afraid to ask for it. Right. That's, that's, uh, so that's really good advice, actually. And I can see if you're a new teacher and you come in and you have to, you, you think that you have to create 20 different le or 10 different lesson plans that you're going to use between three or four students that is going to cause burnout very, very quick very quick so that is some really good advice and as you just mentioned chances are you just need to do a slight tweak or some slight modification mm -hmm. to the lesson plan uh to really help your the, you know a large uh, other section of the special education students in your class so that's very good advice now, I do want to move into something else. I want to talk about something very special. Um, so you posted something. Very, I, I did mention I, I walk, I, I stalked your entire Instagram account. Uh, you did. I, I did see a post that you posted something on social media two years ago, and it really caught my attention. So it's a picture of medication and you talking about mental health. First of all, let me say I deeply admire you for sharing that picture with us or to your followers and having the courage to share that with your followers. Uh, you described mental health in perfect words. I mean, this is, you, you, you stated mental health is just as real as physical health. If your physical health is failing, you go to the doctor, you take medicine. But there is such a stigma about doing that for mental health. Let's end that. And as you may know, there is currently a mental health crisis that is causing teachers to quit because their jobs have gotten so stressful. But what scares me the most is that not every teacher has the luxury to quit their job. There are so many teachers that are burned out and are not doing well mentally, but they do not have the privilege to just stop working. So, Rebecca, I do want to ask you, what can school leaders do to support the mental health of teachers? There's something that my school district had, had started implementing that teachers really appreciated. They gave us e-learning days where students would stay at home for the day with either a work packet or online classes, something that they would do on their own. And teachers would have a day at school to get caught up on lesson plans, get caught up on grading, have some time to reorganize their classroom if they needed to, and just have a day where it wasn't, you have to go 90 to nothing all day long. Because that's, that's one of the biggest things that I think gets teachers so burnt out is that during the day, there is not a moment where you can just have, have downtime. You are constantly on, you're constantly performing, you're entertaining, and it's exhausting. And you carry that home at the end of the day, and you have your own family who needs you and who has questions right. to ask you. And I know there were, there were several days I would come home like, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want anyone to talk to me. I need some quiet. 
and having right. having those days at school where I felt like I could get caught up. I could, you know, sit with a coworker and have lunch that didn't, I didn't have to, you know, inhale it in five minutes and get back to, to kids. That was very helpful. Additionally, um, just like I mentioned before, being present, asking what can we do to support you? Right. And then for, for teachers, okay. you know, aside from, you know, what admin can do for teachers, try to leave it at school, try to leave school at school. When you're home, be at home, take your work email off of your phone, you know, implement your own office hours. If it's going to be after four o'clock, you don't respond to emails, then stick to that. They don't need to have access to you. Do you, you do that? Do you, do you, do you turn off the email notifications when you, Mm -hmm. as soon as you, otherwise I, I I was so hyper-focused on needing to be there for everybody all of the time. I didn't feel like. I could have a moment just for myself. If someone needed me, I needed to be there. And turning off right. those notifications, like whatever they need that afternoon can wait until the morning because that afternoon is my time. It's my time with my family and my child. And that's, it's vital well, that you set that, those boundaries. That is, that is such great advice. Honestly, that is really good advice. Uh, and for every teacher, first, it's not just teachers, it, even if you're a, an employee working at a corporation or a startup, it doesn't matter. We always feel like we need to go ahead and run and solve the issue when we receive an email at 7 p.m. Just because your boss or your leader, if they sent you something at 7 p.m., well, listen, I mean, it's after hours. You're mm-hmm. going to see that the next morning when you're there during your working work time, working hours. So that is really good advice. And I really hope that everybody watching, they do exactly that, especially all the teachers that are watching, do exactly that. Go into your phone settings right now. And it's very, it's very quick. I know how to do that. You, As soon as you leave the school building or you enter into your doorsteps, open the door, just go into your settings and turn off that it's, it's an icon if you have iPhone and you will not get any of those notifications. And then when you wake turn up in the morning, just be turn there back the morning, on. You can check that is on. great. That is really good advice. And there's not going to be any kind of emergency email. If there's an emergency, <laughs> they have your phone number. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so I do have one follow-up question with that. Uh, so do you have any advice that you can share with teachers who are currently struggling with their mental health? So I, we, we actually, we did talk about that, right? So the number one advice, well, I love the advice you just gave, which is mm-hmm. setting the boundaries. Is there anything else perhaps that um, you can share the with them? The only thing I can think of is to really understand the difference between self-care and escapism. So a lot of times, you know, we see self-care okay. as, you know, watching Netflix for a few hours or going to get a pedicure for a couple hours or something. And that kind of takes your mind off of things in the moment, but that's more escape because Mm -hmm. as soon as that movie is over, you go back to real life. You're not actually taking care of anything. So try to put some structure and routine in place to where you're actually caring for yourself a little bit more. If that is prepping your food on Sundays for lunches throughout the week to take to school, that way you don't have to worry about it. That'll help if it's laying your clothes out the night before setting up your mornings the night before so that you're not as rushed in the morning. And maybe you can sit down and have a cup of coffee before you run out the door, before that coffee gets cold. Unless of course, iced coffee, then you want it to be cold right. but before it melts, before the ice melts. <laughs> that's, that's, that's really good advice, actually. I, I love the fact that you distinguished uh, between activities that allow you to just temporarily escape. You're not, you're not doing self-care. Uh, So building out routines, things in advance that'll cause you less stress throughout the work week or day or even the next day. That is some really good advice. And I I should take that into consideration myself, actually. (laughs) I I don't usually pre-plan the night before or think in advance for a couple of days, but that is that's some very good advice. I want to now talk about because you currently no longer are an act. You're not actively teaching in a school right now. So you currently work at uh, Digitability. Digitability. Did I get that right? Uh, that's an organization which is focused on getting special education students ready for the real world. Uh, their mission seems like a perfect fit for you, given your experience working with students as an IEP, as a teacher. Like you found the perfect fit. I mean, I went on their website. It looks cool. I was like, oh, wow, Rebecca, you just <laughs> I you got love it. From, I'm you said, completely the on board with their mission and their 
curriculum. And I just think that it's something that should be in every school and every high school that has, you know, those students with autism or intellectual disabilities that are going to be leaving the classroom and going out into the real world. They need those life skills and those work ready skills for yep. seeking employment once they leave. You know, the statistic is, you know, 30% of people with disabilities find employment and with digitability first cohort, 30% find employment. And then with disabilities, exactly so with digitability's first graduating cohort, they flipped that statistic upside down. We had 70% of our graduates found employment. Wow. How many, how many students were in the cohort? That was before my time. Okay. 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 Wow. That is impressive. That is very, very impressive. So I, I love their mission. I, that, that is, that's something that deeply resonate, resonates with me, but I do want to ask you about what it's like, what's the transition like from working as a teacher to now working at an organization? I know it's very similar, uh, but it, there must be some sort of transition for maybe yeah, for the no, better. I actually, can you, can you, you know, we about talked that? about my mental health. I do see a therapist once a week and she's fabulous. And I highly recommend therapy to everybody. But one of the things I talked to her about it when I was first transitioning to this new career was it was strange to not have every moment of my day dictated. Because with school, it's from this exact time to this exact time we are doing reading. And then from this time to this time, it's a bathroom break and you better use that bathroom break because you're not going to get another one until way later in the afternoon. So every moment of the day was planned. And in this job now, there's so much more freedom to work at my own pace, to work on the projects that I want to work on at the time and make sure everything is ready to go out each week. And it's, it's so much less stress that I didn't even realize I was holding from teaching. And I love teaching. I loved my principal. I loved my students. I loved it so much, but it, it was where it was wearing me down and having the opportunity to stay in education and stay in special education in particular, just in a different capacity and flex some muscles that maybe I hadn't been using in the classroom. It's been, it's been a breath of fresh air. And, you know, I'm not saying I'll never go back to the classroom. I'm not going to, you know, pigeonhole myself into one thing. I'll, I'll keep my options. But for right now, this is where I need to be. And I'm really enjoying it. Wow. It, that's, that's great. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy, first of all, for you that you found, first of all, an organization that you believe in their mission and their mission is fantastic. And it resonates with exactly what you've been doing for all of these years. But yeah, I, I, it's it's like a breath of fresh air, right? You you don't uh, your bathroom break is not dictated by when you can use the bathroom. That's crazy! It's really crazy. I mean, I I'm not a teacher, but like wow, <laughs> I mean, I'm getting stressed out just li listening to just hearing you speak about what it's like being a teacher. I mean, there does there needs to be change, you know. And I'm not going to sit here and talk, you know, say that I have a solution because I don't, and I'm not going to offer one. But there needs to be some kind of change because teachers, it is not an easy job being a teacher. So with that, I do want to segue into the topic of a lot of teachers who are considering leaving their jobs. Now, I'm not in no way, shape or form right. trying to promote teachers to leave, you know, but given the fact that you're no longer actively teaching at school, could you share some advice to those teachers who are just struggling and they want to transition into another career path? What can they what can so they or should they expect? When I was thinking about it, I asked a friend, um, Alexis Shepard. She's on Instagram as the Afro educator. She's amazing and phenomenal. She recommended, you know, going back through my resume and focusing on skills that were applicable in other areas. Mm -hmm. So if I was, you know, mm -hmm. collecting data for an IEP, that skill is being able to analyze data to, you know, work on a project and, you know, go through different scenarios and come up with different ideas and plans. So there's ways that you can take your teacher skills and generalize them more mm -hmm. into other environments. So don't be afraid when you're working on that resume to, to generalize a little bit more. It doesn't have to be teacher specific. Show how your skills in the classroom are valuable to 
other areas as well. Right. That's um that's that is again really good advice. Uh a lot of skills that teachers have almost all of them are are transferable skills meaning you can you can transfer that to another industry. And yeah, I don't want to promote another uh, an industry or that teachers should look at but I for me personally I see so many teachers that would be good at like tech sales like B2B tech sales. There's so many skills that that job that role requires that teachers already have so again I, i'm not trying to promote anybody or anything like that but teachers have they're, 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 teachers are amazing communicators they can present themselves they know how to break down the information to an audience that can understand it so these are skills that are required in many different industries and roles uh so that i mean thank you rebecca that it's kind of all the questions I wanted to ask you today. I, I, I definitely appreciate your time, but I do want to ask, I, I, I'll ask you, I, so have you been seeing any TikToks about artificial intelligence and all of the, the AI that are going on that can generate all of these questions and content? Have you, I, have you I scrolled have. through I any of those? I see Facebook kind of ads yeah. all the time for like AI ads or blogs or something like that. And the all of the artwork that was going around there for a little while. It's it's just mind boggling to me. You know, I, I grew up, I'm in my mid 30s. I remember when there was no internet. And now here we are, you know, the internet is writing ads and articles. It's insane. Yeah. It is crazy. And you know what, we're going to use AI to write some <laughs> caption for this this exact video. And it. we'll see what it generates. But it's 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 incredible. They they analyze the video, they can kind of see like they can, uh, they understand the context of what we're speaking about, and then ge they'll generate a question. But uh, here's uh, uh, three quick questions I have for you. They're fun and silly. They were generated by AI. I simply typed in. I, I literally typed in. I am interviewing a teacher on a podcast. Okay. Give me some questions <laughs> to ask. Some fun questions. Again, these are silly questions. I, I guess I did not need to use uh, AI for this. Uh, <laughs> But uh, here, I'll, it's an interesting question, just to know, to, to get to know you a little bit better. If you could have any superpower, what would it be and why? I would love to fly. And this, it's so funny. I, I think about this often. I think my, my family, we love superhero movies. I've always said, if I could pick a superhero power, I would want to fly. But I want to fly quickly. Like, not just like, like a little bit in town. Like, I want to be able to fly across the country. And like, like so travel fast. How fast are we talking? Like from like, here to like your you like London. Oh yeah, like like really fast. Like or maybe teleportation would be a little more accurate. Maybe I could fly like short distances and then just like teleport and show up somewhere else. That way when it's freezing cold here, I could go to, you know, Hawaii <laughs> and stay on the beach for a few hours and then be back home before dinner. That's definitely a very good superpower. If you can only eat one type of food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Oh, you can't ask me that. Yeah. There's so many. I'm a foodie. Sis. I, oh my word. I, t I, I feel I, like, I feel like people who are addicted to coffee tend to be foodies also. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> because no one is that obsessed with coffee without just loving, you know, the whole experience about food as well. Yeah, exactly. I'll plan entire trips around what city has what restaurant because I'll, I'll want to try something new. I think if I had to pick one right now, I'm feeling sushi okay. a little bit. Okay. Okay. I think I'd go for I would, some sushi. I would pick, oh man, I'd probably pick pizza. Okay. And, uh, I am not as I, I am not as um, sophisticated and elegant as you who who, who who would choose sushi, but that is a great answer. And uh, I will ask you one last question, or okay. this AI generated question: If you could only watch one TV show or movie for the rest of your life, what would it be? Every time you turn on the TV, that is going to be the one that's just coming up over and over and over again. I. Oh, that's hard, but I think I'm going, I would have to go with The Office. Okay, my wife, <laughs> she, she tried, I try to watch Office plenty of times. It's not for me. I'm very sorry. It's not for my husband either. Yeah. He just can't get into it. But that's, that's my go-to comfort show. Like if I've, if I just want to veg out in front of the TV, 
kicked off. And turning off wow. What a great answer and what a great way to end the, uh, end the interview. Rebecca, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It was such a pleasure to get to know you, to get to know the young Rebecca, the the, the Rebecca that was actively teaching all those years to all those special education teachers and the present Rebecca who is now working at a company whose mission is deeply rooted in helping uh, special education students get jobs out in the real world. I mean, that is amazing. Thank you for all that you do. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.